For the first moment or so, I allowed him to do all the talking. I had yet to accustom myself to the newness of things. For you must remember that I had just relinquished a bed of final sickness, and that in casting off the physical body, I had also cast off the sickness with it. And the new sensation of comfort and freedom from bodily ills was one so glorious that the realization of it took a little while to comprehend fully. My old friend seemed to know at once the extent of my knowledge, that I was aware that I had passed on and that all was well. And here let me say that all idea of a judgment seat or a day of judgment was entirely swept from my mind in the actual procedure of transition. It was all too normal and natural to suggest the frightful ordeal that Orthodox religion teaches that we must go through after death. The very conception of judgment and hell and heaven seemed utterly impossible. Indeed, they were wholly fantastic now that I found myself alive and well, clothed in my right mind, and, in fact, clothed in my own familiar habiliments and standing in the presence of an old friend who was shaking me cordially by the hand and giving me greetings and good wishes and showing all the outward, and in this case, genuine, manifestations of being pleased to see me as I was pleased to see him. He himself was in the best of spirits as he stood there, giving me such a welcome as, upon the earth plane, two old friends accord each other after long separation. That in itself was sufficient to show that all thoughts of being marched off to my judgment were entirely preposterous. We both were too jolly, too happy, too carefree, and too natural, and I myself was waiting with excitement for all manner of pleasant revelations of this new world, and I knew that there could be none better than my old friend to give them to me. He told me to prepare myself for an immeasurable number of the pleasantest of surprises, and that he had been sent to meet me on my arrival. As he already knew the limits of my knowledge, so his task was that much the easier. As soon as I managed to find my tongue, after our first breaking the silence, I noticed that we spoke just as we had always done upon the earth. That is, we simply used our vocal cords and spoke, quite as a matter of course. It required no thinking about, and indeed I did not think about it. I merely noted that it was so. My friend was my friend then proposed that as we had no further need or call to stay in the surroundings of my passing, we might move away, and that he would take me to a very nice place that had been made ready for me. He made this reference to a place, but he hastened explaining that in reality I was going to my own house, where I should find myself immediately at home not knowing as yet how one proceeded, or in other words, how I was to get there, I placed myself entirely in his hands, and that, he told me, was precisely what he was there for. I could not resist the impulse to turn and take a last look at the room of my transition. It still presented its misty appearance. Those who were formerly standing around the bed had now withdrawn, and I was able to approach the bed and gaze at myself. I was not the least impressed by what I saw, but the last remnant of my physical self seemed to be placid enough. My friend then suggested that we should now go, and we accordingly moved away. As we departed, the room gradually became more misty until it faded further from my vision and finally disappeared. So far, I had had the use, as usual, of my legs, as in ordinary walking, but in view of my last illness and the fact that, consequent upon it, I should need some period of rest before I exerted myself too much, my friends said that it would be better if we did not use the customary means of locomotion, our legs. He then told me to take hold of his arm firmly and to have no fear whatever. I could, if I wished, close my eyes. It, it would, he said, perhaps be better if I did so. I took his arm and left the rest to him as he told me to do. I at once experienced a sensation of floating such as one has in physical dreams, 
though this was very real and quite unattended by any doubts of personal security. The motion seemed to become more rapid as time went on, and I still kept my eyes firmly closed. It is strange with what determination one can do such things here. On the earth plane, if similar circumstances were possible, how many of us would have closed our eyes in complete confidence? Here there was no shadow of doubt that all was well, that there was nothing to fear, that nothing untoward could possibly take place, and that, moreover, my friend had complete control of the situation. After a short while, our progress seemed to slacken somewhat, and I could feel that there was something very solid under my feet. I was told to open my eyes. I did so. What I saw was my old home that I had lived in on the earth plane. My old home, but with a difference. It was improved in a way that I had not been able to do in its earthly counterpart. The house itself was rejuvenated, as it seemed to me, from a first glance, rather than restored, but it was the gardens around it that attracted my attention more fully. They appeared to be quite extensive, and they were in a state of the most perfect order and arrangement. By this I do not mean the regular orderliness that one is accustomed to see in public gardens on the earth plane, but that they were beautifully kept and tended. There were no wild growths or masses of tangled foliage and weeds, but the most glorious profusion of beautiful flowers so arranged as to, sh as to show themselves to absolute perfection. Of the flowers themselves, when I was able to examine them more closely, I must say that I never saw either their like or their counterpart upon the earth of many that were there in full bloom. Numbers were to be found, of course, of the old familiar blossoms, but by far the greater numbers seemed to be something entirely new to my rather small knowledge of flowers. It was not merely the flowers themselves and their unbelievable range of superb colorings that caught my attention, but the vital atmosphere of eternal life that they threw out, as it were, in every direction. And as one approached any particular group of flowers, or even a single bloom, there seemed to pour out great streams of energizing power, which uplifted the soul spiritually and gave it strength, while the heavenly perfumes they exhaled were such as no soul clothed in its mantle of flesh has ever experienced. All these flowers were living and breathing, and they were, so my friend informed me, incorruptible. There was another astonishing feature I noticed when I drew near to them, and that was the sound of music that enveloped them, making such soft harmonies as corresponded exactly and perfectly with the gorgeous colors of the flowers themselves. I am not, I am afraid, sufficiently learned musically to be able to give you a sound technical explanation of this beautiful phenomena, but I shall hope to bring to you one with knowledge on the subject, who will be able to go into this more fully. Suffice it for the moment, then, to say that these musical sounds were in precise consonance with all that I had so far seen, which was very little, and that everywhere there was perfect harmony. Already I was conscious of the revitalizing effect of this heavenly garden to such an extent that I was anxious to see more of it, and so, in company with my old friend, upon whom I was here relying for information and guidance, I walked the garden paths, trod upon the exquisite grass, whose resilience and softness were almost comparable to walking on air, and tried to make myself realize that all this superlative beauty was part of my own home. There were many splendid trees to be seen, none of which were malformed such as one is accustomed to see on earth, yet there was no suggestion of strict uniformity of pattern. It was simply that each tree was growing under perfect conditions, free from the storms of wind that bend and twist the young branches, and free from the inroads of insect life and many other causes of the mishappenings of earthly trees. As with the flowers, so with, so with the trees. They live forever incorruptible, clothed always in their full 
array of leaves of every shade of green and forever pouring out life to all those who approached near them. I had observed that there did not appear to be what we should commonly call shade beneath the trees, and yet there did not appear to be any glaring sun. It seemed to me to be that there was a radiance of light that penetrated into every corner, and yet there was no hint of flatness. My friend told me that all light proceeded directly from the giver of all light, and that this light was divine life itself, and that it bathed and illumined the whole of the spirit world where lived those who had eyes spiritually to see. I noticed, too, that a comfortable warmth pervaded every inch of space, a warmth perfectly even, and as perfectly sustained. The air had a stillness, yet there were gentle perfume-laden breezes, the truest zephyrus, that in no way altered the delightful balminess of the temperature. And here let me say to those who do not care much for perfumes of any sort, do not be disappointed when you read these words and feel that it could never be heaven to you if there were something there that you do not like. Wait, I say, until you witness these things, and I know then that then you will feel very differently about them. I have gone into all these things in a rather detailed fashion because I am sure there are so many people who have wondered about them. I was struck by the fact that there were no signs of walls or hedges or fences, indeed nothing, so far as I could see, to mark where my garden began or ended. I was told that such things as boundaries were not needed, because each person knew instinctively, but beyond doubt, just where his own garden ended. There was therefore no encroaching upon another's grounds, although all were open to any who wished to traverse them or linger within them. I was wholeheartedly welcome to go wherever I wished without fear of intruding upon another's privacy. I was told I should find that that was the rule here, and that I would have no different feelings with respect to others walking in my own garden. I exactly described my sentiments at that moment, for I wished then and there that all who cared would come into the garden and enjoy its beauties. I had no notion whatsoever of ownership, personally, although I knew that it was my own, to have and to hold. And that is precisely the attitude of all there, ownership and partnership at one and the same time. See in the beautiful state of preservation and care in which all the garden was kept, I inquired of my friend as to the genius who looked after it so assiduously and with such splendid results. Before answering my question, he suggested that as I had but so very recently arrived in the spirit land, he considered it advisable I should rest, or that at least I should not overdo my sightseeing. He proposed, therefore, that we should find a pleasant spot. He used the words in a comparative sense, because all was more than pleasant everywhere, that we should seat ourselves, and then he would expound on one or two of the many problems that had been presented themselves to me in the brief time since I had passed into spirit. Accordingly, we walked along until we found such a pleasant place beneath the branches of a magnificent tree, whence we overlooked a great track of the countryside, whose rich verdure undulated before us and stretched far into the distance. The whole prospect was bathed in glorious celestial sunshine, and I could perceive many houses of varying descriptions, picturesquely situated, like my own, among trees and gardens. We threw ourselves down upon the soft turf, and I stretched myself out luxuriously, feeling as, as though I were laid upon a bed of the finest down. My friend asked me if I was tired. I had no ordinary sensation or of earthly fatigue, but yet I felt somewhat the necessity for a bodily relaxation. He told me that my last illness was a cause of such a desire, and that if I wished I could pass into a state of complete sleep. At the moment, however, I did not feel the absolute, absolute need for that, and I told him that, for the present, I would much prefer to hear him talk. And so he began. Whatsoever a man soweth, he said, that shall he reap. 
Those few words describe exactly the great eternal process by which all that you see, actually here before you, is brought about. All the trees, the flowers, the woods, the houses, that are also the happy homes of happy people, everything is the visible result of whatever a man soweth. This land wherein you are and I are now living is the land of the great harvest, the seeds of which were planted upon the earth plain. All who live here have won for themselves the precise abode they have passed to by their deeds upon the earth. I was already beginning to perceive many things, the principal one of which and that which touched me most closely, being the totally wrong attitude adopted by religion in relation to the world of spirit. The very fact that I was lying there where I was constituted a complete refutation of so much that I taught and upheld during my priestly life upon earth. I could see volumes of orthodox teachings, creeds, and doctrines melting away because they are of no account, because they are not true, and because they have no application whatever to the eternal world of spirit and to the great creator and upholder of it. I could see clearly now what I had seen but hazily before, that orthodoxy is man-made, but that the universe is God-given. My friend went on to tell me that I should find living within the homes that we could see from where we were lying, all sorts and conditions of people. People whose religious views when they were on the earth were equally varied. But one of the great facts of one of the great facts of spirit life is that souls are exactly the same instant after passing into spirit life as they were the instant before. Deathbed repentances are of no avail, since the majority of them are but cowardice born of fear of what is about to happen, a fear of the theologically built eternal hell that such a useful weapon in the, ecclesia <coughs> in the ecclesiastical armory and one that perhaps has caused more suffering in its time than many other erroneous doctrines. Creeds, therefore, do not form any part of the world of spirit, but because people take with them all of their characteristics into the spirit world, the fervid adherence to any particular religious body will continue to practice their religion in the spirit world until such time as their minds become spiritually enlightened we have here, so my friend informed me, I have seen them for myself, whole communities still exercising their old earthly religion. The bigotry and prejudices are all there, religiously speaking. They do no harm except to themselves, since such matters are confined to themselves. There is no such thing as making converts here. Such being the case, then, I suppose, that our own religion was fully represented here. Indeed, it was. The same ceremonies, the same ritual, the same old beliefs, all are being carried on with the same misplaced zeal in churches erected for the purpose. The members of these communities know that they have passed on, and they think that part of their heavenly reward is to continue with their man-made forms of worship. So they will continue until such time as a spiritual awakening takes place. Pressure is never brought to bear upon these souls. Their mental resurrection must come from within themselves. When it does come, they will taste for the first time the real meaning of freedom. My friend promised that if I wished, we could visit some of these religious bodies later. But he suggested that as there was plenty of time, it would be better if, if first of all, I became quite accustomed to the new life. He had so far left unanswered my question as to who was the kindly so who tended my garden so well, but he read my unspoken thought and reverted to the matter himself. Both the house and the garden, he told me, were the harvest I had reaped for myself during my earth life. Having earned the right to possess them, I had built them with the aid of generous souls who spent their life in the spirit world performing such deeds of kindness and service to others. Not only was it their work, but it was their pleasure at the same time. Frequently this work is undertaken and carried out by those who on earth were expert in such things and who also had a love for it. 
Here they can continue with their occupation under conditions that only the world of spirit can supply. Such tasks bring their own spiritual rewards, although the thought of reward is never in the minds of those who perform them. The desire of being of service to others is always uppermost.